And I've been promising you uh, all day long that Mr. Henry Vaccaro Sr. will be here in the studio live. And uh, Mr. Vaccaro has been kind enough to uh, stop in and say hello. And uh, the reason for the visit, not that we really need one because him and I have about a billion things to talk about, but there's a new book, Johnny Cash is a Friend of Mine, which uh, is available now and tomorrow. Henry will be on the boardwalk in Asbury Park doing a book signing for uh, those people. And it's over by the uh, McLoon's restaurant. Right. In, in there. So welcome to 90.5 The Night, sir. Nice oh, to have you. Oh, my pleasure to be here. And uh, for uh, those of us that have lived around the Jersey Shore for the last 30 or 40 years or longer, it's been, uh, it, your name is synonymous with Asbury Park. It's, uh, you know, you, you, it's just a name that everybody knows if you're in this area, that uh, all the stuff that you've done. But um, like your son and I were talking before we went on the air, there's a lot of people that are kind of new to the region who don't know a lot about the history of Asbury Park and uh, your place in that history of Asbury Park. So I wanted to have you come on board, especially when I found out that you had written down the book to uh, talk about your, your relationship with Johnny Cash, his relationship with Asbury Park. So let's start from the beginning. You were a native son of uh, the Asbury Park area, right? Was that Interlaken? Was, was no, that where it, you grew up or Asbury? It, no, I was born in Asbury in okay. 1940. Mm -hmm. Went to Holy Spirit Grammar School. And 1946, our family moved to Interlaken. And I grew up in Interlaken. So you're, you're a lifelong resident of this lovely Jersey Shore. All and, my life. And you, uh, you tell a story in the book about how you first came, uh, became aware of Johnny Cash. I mean, in the day, a lot of people, I, I get the feeling that some people don't realize that uh, the Man in Black started off as, as a rock and roller more than more than uh, uh than a country you know back in the day sun records and all that he was right there with with elvis and with carl perkins and jerry lee lewis and all those guys he was much more of a rock and roller than he was into the country scene as far as radio was concerned so uh so there you were in the 50s you know did you have yeah. a da and and listening to no, uh, I, I had a crew cut <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh you know back then you were hillbilly if you listen to country music right and uh, you didn't get it out east too much um so, you know, I, I would listen to uh, on the radio, and I heard uh, Walk the Line, and uh, uh, my favorite song was Ways of a Woman in Love, uh, which uh, Johnny sang on the Sun Records. And, you know, funny thing, talking about Sun Records, they've just inked a deal, I read about it last night, that, uh, that Sun Records is reissuing Johnny Cash's first single on Sun Records on a new 7-inch final to commemorate the anniversary of it. I think it's the 60th anniversary of it, if I'm not mistaken. And so they're releasing the first single that he did for Sun Records on a, on a 45 on, on vinyl. So uh, your timing is perfect for, yeah. uh, for coming out with this book on very, very different levels. So you're back there in the 50s as a teenager and you're listening to the radio and you're listening to Johnny Cash and you become a huge fan of his. How do you go from being a fan of, of Johnny Cash to becoming friends with Johnny Cash? That's an incredible thing. I mean, from a fan to become best friends with their idol. Yeah. And spend 30 years with him is, uh, is a dream come true. I'm so honored that he even knew my name, <laughs> yeah, really. And, you know, I travel with him on his tour bus and uh, just incredible. You basically got adopted by the Carter family, too. I mean, I you know, June and, and, her, and everybody, John, everybody was like, you know, totally behind you. And, and you were part of their family. They were part of yours. Absolutely. And uh, I think the first, uh, really, when we came together was I took him on a fishing trip down to Bimini in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just two of us on a boat fishing. You get to know somebody pretty well when you're out in the middle of the ocean on a boat. You either you, you get to talk a lot. Well, you do. John Carter was with us and mm -hmm. Bob Wooten, but they were down below, and I'm up on the top deck uh, you're just sitting and talking to Johnny, talking about the, I think, one of the funniest things. I asked him how come he left Sun Records, and he said, well, Henry, old Sam Phillips forgot how to count. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, like my first royalty check for, um, like, Walk the Line was under $100. And uh, he just says he forgot how to count. Yeah, he was a nice man, but he wasn't a stupid man. So he decided to uh, to go where the grass was a little greener and where they would actually pay him what he was due. Was in behind the scenes, he had this aura of very stoic and soft spoken, and uh, you know, and, and not somebody to, to wouldn't mince a lot of words. Was that the way he was in person? Yes, but in some ways he was shy. He was a shy person. He kept to himself, but uh, when he said something, he meant it. Mm -hmm. You were friends with him during a time period when <clears throat> he was, you know, at the top of the top of his game. I mean, he was in, being inducted into all the different Halls of Fame. He's the only guy that's, I think he's the only one that's ever been inducted into the Country Hall of Fame, the Rock Hall of Fame, the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. And Songwriters And Hall Songwriters Hall of, Hall of Fame. So you saw him, you know, basically at the apex of his career. He was riding high as, as, as a, you know, as a huge international star. Was he like put off by the stardom? Was he, uh, was he like, did he wall himself in, you know, into an inner circle of friends kind of thing? 
in some ways, but in other ways, uh, to keep his feet on the ground, uh, he planted a cotton bush in his front lawn to remind him where he came from. Yeah, because he was a cotton. He was a, he picked cotton in, uh, and, when he was growing up. In Dias, Arkansas. Yeah, as a kid, as a five-year-old. It's funny, whenever you talk to people who are of, an, of his generation and they, they tell you how they grew up, it always makes us, like the struggles that those of us of this generation kind of pales in comparison. You know, we weren't sitting out there in the fields with five years old picking cotton from daylight to, day, day, to the end of the day, you know, just to put food on the table. That wasn't something we had to do. No, so. we're very lucky today. But also gave him an, a, worth, a work ethic. That, uh, it certainly did. And also a religion, too, and that played into, uh, into you as well because you had a little rough patch of time there, and he was kind of instrumental in and uh, in getting you a little bit of... Uh, yeah, he, did, real- he, he did. He got me to go back to church and basically kind of save my life because I was, a few years later, I was going through a major bankruptcy and I got wiped out. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was through his inspiration, I went back to church. So It's a crazy story. I mean, I was um, in the wedding party of Bob Wooten, who's his guitar player. Bob right. and I are best of friends. We've, and, like, we've, we've had Bob here. He's played in Asbury before, right. most recently, yeah. Yeah. And um, the wedding took place in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and um, it's kind of a redneck place. And if you recall, Philadelphia is where the three civil rights leaders were murdered. Mm-hmm. And the sheriff that killed these kids was at the wedding. I mean, he's like a hero in his town. And uh, anyway, we I flew out there and to uh, Philadelphia. We landed in, in Meridian, Mississippi, and then they had a van, picked us up, took us to the, the wedding. And my tuxedo, I called in the measurements ahead of time, so it was there waiting. Got dressed in a little ante room behind the church and... We go in the front door, and the door opens, and behind the, the altar is a giant Confederate flag. And we're walking down the aisle, and all of a sudden, the organist is not playing Here Comes the Bride, playing Dixie. do 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 You realize you ain't in Jersey anymore. Yeah, I realized that fast. Yeah. And uh, anyway, we got up on, and uh, during the wedding ceremony, Bob picked up a guitar, and he sang Love Me Tender to Vicky, and she picked up a banjo and sang back to him, and they got married. And there was a little reception next door, and Johnny was there, and John Carter, and uh, Earl Ball, and Marty Stewart. And so Johnny turned to me, and he says, Henry, you have to get back to New Jersey, don't you? And I said, yes. He says, I have a Lear coming in. He says, can I drop you a Tita Burr? Absolutely. <laughs> so, anyway, we flew back to Nashville where they dropped uh, off uh, Marty and uh, his father and, and Earl. So now we take off and uh, fly to Tita Burr, John Carter, myself, and Johnny Cash. And it's like flying in a bullet. <laughs> So um, you can have to picture the inside of the plane. I'm all sitting to the right, to the left is Johnny Cash, and in the back is John Carter, and he's fast asleep. And I always gave Johnny Cash his space. A lot of people are always on top of him. I mean, he doesn't need me to be on top of him. I just leave him alone, and he's reading something. I'm reading a magazine, and I glanced over, and he was reading the Bible. And next thing I know, it's thunder and lightning, and the plane is shaking a little bit, and Johnny turns to me, and he says, Henry, he says, I never hear you talk about God. What church do you go to? And I looked at him, and I said, Johnny, I don't go to church. He says, how come? And I just, well, it's a long story. You don't want to hear it. He says, yes, I do. I said, oh, crap. What am I going <laughs> to tell this guy? So I tell him the truth. I said, I was brought up Catholic, and I got disenchanted with the church for a few reasons, but probably the main reason, uh, my company was building a major high school in Piscataway, New Jersey, called St. Pius, the 10th high school, and there was problems on the job with the architect. And to cover up the problems, he tried to throw me off the job and then bring another contractor on to cover everything up, and I didn't budge. So, uh, make a long story short, we ended up, we had a meeting with the bishop in Trenton, uh, Bishop George W.R. I attended the meeting, and I knelt down, I kissed his ring, I did all the right stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and the bishop says, look, I've got to get my school open. And uh, he says, we're going to hire another engineer, make some corrections, but we got to keep our architect, and I want you to go back and finish the job, and I'll make sure you get paid. And at the end, we'll sit down and have a meeting like this and work out any problems. I said, yes, Your Holiness. I went back and finished the job, and I told John they didn't pay me. And I said, and I sued the church, and I won. I was proud. I sued this big church, and I won. I mean, I'm about 25 years old at the time. Mm-hmm. So he says, Henry, he says, remember something. The bishop is only a mortal man, and he sins too. There's a God up there. You should go back to church. And I said, you know, you're right. And I'm yesing him to death. I don't <laughs> want to talk about church. This is the, the 80s. I mean, everything I touch turned to gold. I've got a, a home on the ocean and deal. i got a big hotel. i got a guitar factory, an industrial park, big construction company. And quite frankly, I thought my S didn't stink. Mm-hmm. You know? But I came down to earth real quick. A few years later, the whole my whole world is falling apart. I mean, uh, the partnership with Carabetta, the developer in Asbury's, 
not working out. We've got problems in the hotel and construction businesses falling apart. And um, I woke up one Sunday morning and I heard Johnny Cash's voice, Henry, go to church. Well, I put TV on a little louder and pulled the cover over my head and went back to sleep. 11 o'clock, I get up, same words, Henry, go to church. And now I got chills. I got dressed. The hardest thing I did was to go over to Mount Carmel Church and sneak in the side door. And they let you in. They, yeah, they do they that. they let me in. I yeah. was so ashamed. I really was. And, and I sat in the back row, and uh, I just got this peaceful feeling came over me that I could conquer the world, not knowing what's going to face me, you know, a year or so later when I ended up filing a bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, so mm, I, I would now go to church every Sunday, and I just was at peace with the world. And I don't push my religion on anybody, but I know how it affected me. I get a phone call from June. She says, Henry, we're going to come to the Berkeley for the weekend. Can you arrange for a limo to pick us up at Newark Airport? I said, no, I'm going to pick you up, and please tell Johnny I went back to church. She said, he'll be so proud of you. No, I didn't think anything of this. I pick him up, and the first words out of his mouth, he says, June said you went back to church. I said, I did. He says, pretty awkward, huh? I said, well, a little bit. He said, what service do you go to? I said, I go to 1030 Mass. Come by the hotel and pick me up. I'm going with you. Now, Johnny's Baptist. I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. The next five times Johnny Cash ever came to Asbury Park, New Jersey, he went to church with me, <laughs> including the Sunday morning after being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Saturday night at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, he came to Asbury Park to go to church with me. Uh, but, see, that's, that's one of the things that people don't realize. I think a lot of people that are listening right now don't know that Johnny Cash and his wife, June, lived basically lived in Asbury Park, a part, part of the time at least. For about four years, I think, Yeah, right? well, about from... from 80, 83 yeah. to, like, 88 or something like no, that. No, to 92. 92. So for that long, that he was here in town, and he was in Asbury Park, and he was... Uh, the part that, uh, you know, you were talking about the the and the construction in Asbury Park as the part, and the guitar factory. A lot of people don't realize or, or may not know that you owned one of the premier guitar manufacturing companies in the world, located right here in Asbury Park, the Kramer Guitar. It was in Neptune. It was in Neptune over there. And uh, a lot of people, like Sonny Ken worked there, a lot of people I know, Andy Papiccio, all kinds of people from the local area. I'm forgetting like a million other people, but uh, a lot of a lot of the local musicians spent time working in that you know in in that uh, guitar shop. Uh, Patillo was one of the major guys in there. Phil Patillo was a genius. Yeah, he's just, an, uh, he was an amazing luthier. Yeah. And... Uh, and that was yours. And it was, you know, uh, Eddie Van Halen well, put, was one of the, the people money behind the, it. I put the money in the company, but we... That know, made it yours. two other partners. That, that, <laughs> that, that made it yours. I know that the other guys were in on it, too, as well, but uh, was uh, Girardi was... Uh, Dennis, Berardi. Dennis Berardi. And Berardi. another guy, Peter LaPlaca. Yep. And the, and the first original partner was Gary Kramer. Right. But, but Gary, thank God, he lived in Marina Del Rey, California, and he moves to New Jersey. Where does he take up residence? In Sea Caucus, and he's commuting to Asbury. Why would anybody? No, no. Well, I don't know, but make it. So he didn't like it. He wanted to move back to California. Yeah. So I structured a deal and I bought him out. Yeah. And I became the controlling interest in the company. And for a while, Kramer Guitar was the preeminent guitar for heavy metal. And I mean, yeah. Stanley Jordan was one of your big players, too. But uh, you had Stanley Eddie Van Clark. Stanley Clark, Stanley. rather. Um, but you had uh, Eddie Van Halen, was one of your major people, yeah. you know, promoting it. And, and, and it was a. Uh, Twisted Sister and Queensryche and all the heavy metal guys. All of them were yours. They were. You know, so you, you should have invested in spandex as well. You would have made, <laughs> would have made a, a, another fortune on top of it, you know, would have matched the two up. The other part of the puzzle that people don't know, or part of the story, I should say, is that in the, in the 80s, you were the owner uh, or co-owner of the Berkeley Carter Rat. With my brother. With your brother. And um, there was a deal made. I mean, you'll have to explain it exactly, but this is what I remember that there was a time when the Ocean Avenue was going to be redeveloped and there were all these players involved that were going to have a major stake in the redevelopment of the ocean front in Asbury Park. And it was obviously you and your brother. It was Mr. Johnny Cash was going to be involved in it, but also Jacques Cousteau right. and the Jackson family, Michael Jackson in particular, but the Jackson family and Ernie Anastas was yep. part of the deal as well. And as I remember, and, and feel free to correct me whenever I make this wrong, but I think Jacques Cousteau wanted to open up and build an aquarium and, and, let me just backtrack yeah. a little bit. Okay. Uh, initially in the uh, hotel, which came first, the mm -hmm. restoration of the hotel. Which is the Berkeley Carteret. In 1983, Johnny Cash was an initial partner along with Ernie Anastas and um, other uh, limited partners. Mm -hmm. Then came the Carabetta contract where we were partners with Carabetta, my brother, myself, and the entire beachfront development. And fast forward, this is now 85, but fast forward to 89, the whole real estate market crashed basically. Right. 
I mean, major banks that were our lenders failed and so forth. So Carabetta came up with a new concept. He brought on board a man by the name of Bob Petralia, who was formerly a, a regional, not a regional, but a vice president of Warner Communications on one of their entertainment divisions. And they were going to change the concept from uh, basically housing to a regional entertainment complex. Mm -hmm. And they had three major pavilions. You're right. One was Jacques Cousteau, which was going to be a... Uh, an undersea aquarium. He didn't believe in, in, in having live fish in an aquarium. So it was all going to be uh, interactive with, uh, you know, models of fish and the whole nine yards. Then you had the Jackson Entertainment Pavilion. And then you had one called, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but it was Ringling Brothers was involved and called Cosmic Journey, where you're going to be in, interactive with uh, space pods and, and everything. And the game plan was to bring massive amount of people to Asbury so you could now trade on getting corporate sponsorships because the number of people that would, would visit these attractions on a year-round basis. So it sounded really great on paper. It was great on paper. But it didn't quite turn out that way. No. Uh, was it just, you know, the fact that it was overreaching or was it that it was just bad luck because timing when when Carabetta, was that well, how to pronounce his name? His, he Joe went, Carabetta. He, his company failed and it was like a like dominoes just fell because every, everybody else was tied to him basically, right? Yes, but it, it's more than that. And because I know I was there. I was his partner, so I knew what happened. I mean, there was five major banks that failed. Uh, we had the Tom's River Bank, which gave us a mortgage on the Berkeley, failed. You had Marine Midland Bank. I don't know whether they actually went under, but they were absolved by somebody. Riverside Savings Bank went under. Bank of Boston, which gave a $42 million loan commitment to the Carabet organization, which my, I own with my brother, to build a C8 high-rise. Mm -hmm. After investing $18 million in a project, they pulled the plug and wouldn't lend out any more money. So that started a house of cards and everything collapsed. Now, the C8, isn't that that structure that was on 3rd? I think it's 4th, 3rd and 4th. 3rd and 4th Avenue, that, uh, that that semi that they blew up a few years ago. Like, yeah, we blew it up. Yeah, you guys blew it up. Mm -hmm. That was like the big news when you blew it up and then somebody else rebuilt it and stopped halfway up again. Correct. I yeah. mean, there's not many people can say they built a building and then blew up the same building, no. but I did it. <laughs> it must have given you a little bit of satisfaction, actually, to put the push down on the plunger to blow that sucker up. Well, the funny thing, this is this is a crazy story. My little grandson, uh, Henry III, mm -hmm. uh, they had a big ceremony set up on a roof of a convention hall with the mayor and deputy mayor pushing down the plunger. It was a fake plunger, mm -hmm. okay? About a block away from the structure was my little grandson with the real control, and <laughs> as they counted down, he pressed the button to blow the building up. So, now, that's a story that any little kid, any little boy uh, would like to know. He, he probably won't let you live that down until he's, like, in his 80s. No, but it's funny as hell because it's all on video. And then he goes home and he tells my daughter, he says, you know, Aunt Tony, I'm tired. Now, this is 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And we had to get him up at 6, put a hard hat on him. He says, I just blew up this big building. He <laughs> says, can I have my bottle and my blanket now so I go to sleep? <laughs> I, I feel that way most Saturday mornings myself, actually, but that's, that's a story for a different time. The book is, uh, is an incredibly quick read. There are great stories on it, some touching stories, some great, you know, your, your interaction with June Carter and the Carter family and, of course, Johnny Cash and, and the people that down in the Bahamas when you used to go down all the time, fishing, down, yeah. down on the fishing trips, and the way uh, your, your, you know, mutual affection between your family and his family. Um, it, the, it's, great, it's great insight into Asbury Park into the what happened in the 80s and early 90s. What do you think of Asbury Park now? You know, you've been around now for, you've seen it in, the, when you were born, it was, at, oh, it was at, at the peak. You know, it was the, you know, I hear stories about, you used to have the blackout curtain rolling along the boardwalk, and it's when, you know, the Dorseys would play at the convention hall, and, and uh, the radio station WCAP was broadcasting out of, a, out of convention hall. And, it was an incredible time. You know, and then... All through the fifth, the sixties, and the Stones were playing there, and Led Zeppelin were playing there, and the Doors, and all these bands were playing over on the convention hall. And then you saw it with the riots, and then it went down the toilet. And you tried your best to build it back up again, and it kind of faltered a little bit. What do you think of it now? Well, let me just go back one other thing. As a kid growing up, I saw Bill Haley and the Comets. That was my first rock concert, at, and I got addicted to music <laughs> in, in in the casino building. Believe it or not. Sure. But some, some people don't realize a casino building used to be a great little concert hall. And used to, I mean, I don't remember it. It was before my time, but wasn't there like an indoor skating rink in at, there? Or at one time, but yeah. believe it or not, the casino, you could hold more for a concert than convention hall mm. because convention hall was restricted by the seating around it. The casino building at the time had a balcony, but you could be underneath the balcony. So in other words, you could have standing room, you could put five, 6,000 people in there. 
since you were a big fan of rock and roll growing up with Bill Haley and uh, the early music of Johnny Cash, as you got to know Johnny and he was more ingrained into the country culture then with Marty Stewart and those kind of uh, people, did you find yourself being a country fan? Did you buy a, did you buy a uh, 10 oh, gallon hat? Or? No. <laughs> I was always a country fan. Yeah. I didn't need Johnny to make me a country fan. Okay. I mean, it's the music of our land. Yeah. And it at, least truly American. at least you can understand it when they talk, <laughs> when they sing. <laughs> the only two forms of music that are truly American, jazz and country, those are yeah. the two that are, that are basically ours. Well, um, it's just been a pleasure to finally get a chance to hang out and meet with you. The book signing is tomorrow. What time tomorrow? Uh, between 3 and 6. 3 and 6. Over at Star Rocket, which is in the building next to McLoon's Restaurant on the boardwalk. Which is the old Howard Johnson's. Old Howard Johnson. I'm sure you spent a little bit of time there, too. Well, I, I did the foundations for that building. Did you really? When I was uh, 20 years old for Britain Construction Company. <laughs> And uh, and the other thing too is uh, if you, uh, when people buy the book and, and read it, there's a, a great you know little story about your dad who yeah. was uh, given a, a special honor by the Vatican. And uh, there's uh, you know your family did so much for the people of Asbury Park back in the 20s and 30s and 40s and uh, onwards through the 50s and stuff. But your dad and your brother and your uh, dad's brother were uh, big doctors, great doctors here, and uh, all the work that you've done with your construction company and the way you uh, your place in music history is pretty much cemented with Kramer guitar and, and what that pro and what that produced. And uh, the stories are incredible. The pictures are great. They're like watching somebody's private home home. Uh, well, what I, what I try to do is to show pictures of every story that's in the book so you can put the person there and every picture backs up the story. It's been uh, 10 years since since Johnny Cash yeah. passed away. Almost uh, 10 years will be September, I think, right? Yep. I think is when. And uh, in those intervening years, um, you know, what, what's your fondest memory? When looking back, like what, you know, if, if somebody were to say to you, what's the best moment you had with Johnny Cash, what was it? I had a few of them. Okay, yeah. one of them was um, being a roaster at a, at a roast. He was honored in Memphis, Tennessee in 1988. Johnny received the Shalom Peace Award mm -hmm. from the state of Israel. A lot of people don't know this, but Johnny made a movie called Gospel Road about the story of Christ, and it's in music. And he made the, the movie in Israel, and he gave some of the proceeds to the state of Israel for letting him make the movie, gave the rest of it to the Billy Graham organization, nice. and uh, footed the whole uh, production cost himself. But it was an honor to be on a dais with the likes of Waylon Jennings and uh, Chris Christopherson. And, oh, the highwaymen. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody. It was good. And then again, uh, you know, being an honorary Paul Meredith's funeral. Out of that alone must have been just an, an amazing honor. Pretty amazing. You know, well, thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your uh, your history with Johnny Cash, and who is a true American legend, and, and to get some insight into what he was like as a person and uh, the, the kind of how he affected you in your life. And uh, thanks for everything you've done for Asbury Park and for letting us in on some of the some of the stuff that happened in town back 30 years ago because it was pretty interesting. Yeah, Too bad it didn't sure. work out. Well, we tried. Yeah. You, know, you can never fault somebody for trying. And, and the difference was I put my money where my mouth was. Right. And you and they people messed it up for you, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, it is what it is. Yeah. I, I can handle it. That's, That's the main thing. Well, listen, sir, it's great to have you in here. It's a pleasure to finally get a chance to hang out and uh, talk with you at length. The book is called Johnny Cash is a friend of mine. It's available. It's a it's a great book, and you'll be there tomorrow afternoon from three until six. I will uh, signing the book and telling some more stories. So thank you very much for coming in. Okay. Thank and you. Uh, hanging out with us here at WBJBFM, Lincroft, Middletown. We're back right after this.